You guys got so quiet. <laughs> so hello, welcome everyone to the first ever cooperation of the Psychedelic Society of Vienna and Students for Sensible Drug Policy Vienna. Uh, my name is Orshi, over there. <laughs> I started the Austrian chapter of Students for Sensible Drug Policy which is an international grassroots organization that mobilizes and empowers young people to take part in the political process. And we're pushing for sensible policies to achieve a safer and more just future for ourselves. And we're fighting against the current counterproductive prohibitionist policies, particularly the, those that really harm us as students and young people. Um, I kind of feel like I have to give a disclaimer here that we, not, that we don't condone or condemn drug use. We just respect everybody's right to take decisions about their bodies and their future. And we want everybody to stay safe. So this is about SSDP. And the reason that I am investing a lot of energy and time in establishing this is um, because Two years ago, when I was studying in my master's program of communication science, I started talking about my own interest in psychedelics. So this is social sciences. It was nothing to do with the substances. I was interested in the stigma and how it impedes research and people's rights to basic human rights. And I was met with a very, well, it was a surprising reaction for me, but as I learned more about the subject, I realized this is very common that um, I basically got kind of isolated, um, not just academically, but it affected my social life as well. I was the drug user, the junkie, um, just because of one part of my life didn't really um, fit people's expect expectations of what a responsible adult should do. Um, so I'm really excited to sit here and host amazing people who work to erase the stigma that I've experienced firsthand. Um, I would like you guys to introduce yourself really quick uh, as a starters, and then we dive into our topic, psychedelic science. Hi, my name is Natalie Ginsberg, and I'm the Policy and Advocacy Director at MAPS, which is the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, um, and I live in Oakland, California. Hi, everybody. How are you all doing? Thank you for coming. It's late on a Tuesday. The weather's been really nice. We're happy to have you indoors. Thank you for being here with us. My name is Ismail Lodido Ali. Uh, I work as Policy and Advocacy Council at the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies. Uh, I'm a lawyer and I work in policy and advocacy with a background in human rights and criminal justice reform. I got involved with Students for Sensible Drug Policy myself uh, four years ago in 2014. And then while I was in law school, actually, while I was a graduate student, and then started, led my chapter at the end of my law school career, and then recently have transitioned into leadership. And I'm currently serving as the chair of the board of directors of Students for Sensible Drug Policy as well. Um, and have the immense privilege of getting to work with these incredible people and talking about these amazing subjects in a lot of different contexts. And I'm really looking forward to sharing things with you all today. Hi, hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. And thanks to Marlene and Orsi for the invitation. Uh, my name is Constanta Sanchez. I'm, well, I work in, um, the, at the International Center for Ethnobotanical Education, Research, and Service. We are based in, in Barcelona, Spain. And well, I'm a drug policy researcher and advocate, and I uh, coordinate our legal, um, human rights, and policy and advocacy activities. Um, happy to be here. Um, hello and good evening. My name is Melina Rupp. Um, I'm very, I'm very happy to see you all here. We were for a short while, while we were considering of uh, changing the room to a smaller room, and I'm very happy that we didn't do that. <laughs> um, so I am Elena. I am the author of the science blog sapiensoup.com, where I published a series of articles about psychedelic drugs. Um, and I'm also the co-founder of the Psychedelic Society in Vienna about which I will tell you a little bit more at the end of our event today. Also, 
I'll try to use this one. Uh, thank you guys so much for coming today, and yeah, all of you for showing up in such a great number. Um, so to get us on uh, the same page, I would like to start with a question for you guys, and it would be cool if more of you would answer. So what do we mean when we talk about psychedelics? What are psychedelics, and why is it important for us to talk about them in this context? You can't hear me. We'll make do with one mic. Uh, so the question I asked is, just to clarify, uh, to get all of us on the same page, what do we mean when we talk about psychedelics? What are these substances and why is it important for us to talk about them? I'll start by just giving some basic definitions to start us off. The word psychedelic means mind manifesting, which really gives us a pretty broad range of effects. And the word psychedelic as a noun is often used to describe the substances that help us manifest our mind. The root and the similarity between these substances, although they have a tremendous variety of different effects and they come from chemicals and they come from molecules and they come from plants and they come from our own minds, essentially is that they give us access to some sort of altered state that, depending on the experience, can illuminate different parts of one's experience or one's inner self. And I'll pass it on to give a little bit more context. <laughs> well, I was actually, I was actually offering maybe um, a, little, a little, personal, little personal view on the topic. Um, and we can later talk about what psychedelics, what the definition of psychedelics are, but maybe to, um, to give you an idea of why people get interested, become interested in psychedelics, I could share my own story, like really, really short with you. That uh, like years ago, um, these substances had a, had a profound impact on my life. They helped me working through, working through my own issues in ways that that maybe more conventional therapies couldn't. And um, my personal opinion is, is that we live in a, that we live in an over-medicated society. Like so many people suffer from, suffer from all sorts of addiction and depression and anxiety and, and various, like some a little more and some a little less. And while, while classical psych meds like benzodiazepines and antidepressants, etc., uh, certainly help relieving the symptoms. I think that they rarely tackle the underlying issues. And uh, I think that psychedelics offer a very different approach here. I think they work exactly where it hurts the most. And, um, and in that way, they offer this very different approach, an approach that really inspires me and uh, an approach that you guys can certainly talk a lot about, like what you see in your work about what is possible with psychedelics, this transformative, this transformative effect in people. When you were speaking, I was thinking a lot about how psychedelic um, healing or psychedelic therapy tends to work kind of more holistic ways, right? You were describing a lot of the, our, our current approach to mental health and, and to pharmaceutical medication is often very symptoms focused. And, even, and maybe you'll be prescribed multiple different medicines to address multiple different symptoms and never really are, are trying to understand the root cause of all of the, the difficulties that you're facing. So um, one of the really powerful things I find about psychedelics is that they tend to work in this broader kind of expanded way and because of that often um, can work in quite well in collaboration with other holistic healing modalities you know things like yoga meditation just things that really take into account your full um, your mind and body as as one entity instead of these separate um, things 
All right, thank you guys so much for sharing your personal stories and point of views. Um, so I would like to dive into our topic, which is psychedelic science, a new frontier in mental health, and what the organizations that you work for do in exploring this new frontier, and maybe a little bit of how you got into your line of work and your relationship to psychedelics and this new way of treating mental health. My story actually does have a bit to do with um, what I was just mentioning, um, and I was working as a social worker, actually in graduate school, working, um, first I was a guidance counselor at a middle school in the South Bronx in a really highly kind of traumatized, high poverty neighborhood, um, and then I was working at an alternative sentencing court for people who are arrested for prostitution, um, so instead of um, being sent to be incarcerated to prison, they have the option of mandatory therapy. Um, and in working in those contexts just really helps me see, that one, that our approach to, to mental health was really broken because it was so symptoms focused and it felt like we were just putting band-aids on. Um, but on top of that, that so much of the trauma and struggles that people that I were meeting with were facing um, weren't just about something a little bit off in their brain or, you know, a chemical imbalance, but that they had experienced systemic huge issues like racism, police violence, things that are caused poverty that caused their lives to, um, you know, things to, th these difficulties to develop. So that, um, my, that experience led me to, to work in drug policy reform um, because I saw that, I thought that was, um, in the United States, uh, drug policy is kind of driving our, our mass incarceration um, issue when a, m a majority of people are incarcerated for nonviolent drug offenses. Um, so that's kind of how I got to that work. And then when I was working in drug policy, I started reading, literally just reading the psychedelic science research. And I was like, hmm, this looks really interesting. What is this thing that can help address addiction and depression and PTSD? Things that my teachers were telling me, these are different diseases. This is what the brain looks like. This requires this kind of, all these different, and, and I also don't mean to demean the many modalities that are developed to treat these many different things. Um, but that, yeah, just the, having that context and then learning about the work was actually what first drew me. But I have to say it is quite funny at, at my work because most people in the psychedelic field, you know, have had very personal experiences. And I will say I've made up for lost time. But when I first started working at MAPS, I was really like, wow, the research is fascinating. <laughs> um, and, you know, cannabis had been an, a psychedelic ally to me and I think had kind of helped me have an understanding of what other psychedelics might entail. But... So what does MAPS do? Thank you. <laughs> um, so MAPS, our, our goal is developing the medical, legal, and cultural context for the beneficial use of psychedelics and cannabis. So that mission is quite big, and we've decided to focus and prioritize on the medical space initially, well, for the first 30 years, because MAPS was founded 30 years ago. And in that vein, we conduct... FDA approved, um, which is the medical um, drug development system in the U.S., um, though we also do research outside of the U.S., but um, federally approved um, drug development research, and our focus, our main area of focus is using MDMA-assisted psychotherapy to treat PTSD, um, and we've been quite successful with our, we've just finished phase um, one and two of this research and starting phase three, which is the final phase of research. Um, and we expect to finish in 2021, um, and our results are incredibly promising, so much so that we've actually received breakthrough therapy designation. It's called from the F FDA, which basically indicates that they are so excited by our results that they want to work with us to make sure that um, this process will keep going. And then on top of that, we received another agreement called the Special Protocol Assessment Agreement, which basically... Um, means that if we get, if our results are like at, at a certain level of success follow, following up on our, similar to our phase two results, that their FDA is actually required to approve it as medicine. So we're really, really excited. Um, and we do research with a few other substances, but I'll let Ismail um, tell you a bit about that. 
Hello again. So I'll start with a little bit of the background, like how I got here and then how that's related to the work that I'm doing now with MAPS. And it is kind of a crossover of that personal story and the larger structural issue. I was 11, year old, 11 years old when 9-11 happened. And after 9-11 in the United States, there was a huge reaction by the domestic law enforcement to begin spying and doing illegal surveillance and other infringements and uh, curtailments of civil liberties in the United States. So as a teenager, I became very disillusioned very quickly around this relationship with my faith. I was raised Muslim. My family are both immigrants to the United States, and I felt like that was a system that I could agree with in some ways. And yet I was being told and seeing this huge shift in the culture that was reacting to this identity that I had that I didn't even fully understand, at least at the time. And then right around the time I was kind of 16, 17 years old, I began exploring kind of these ways of grounding and with these ways of expanding my experience, partially as a reaction to this trauma and this fear and this kind of dis dissociation that I was experiencing as a young person directly as a result of that kind of political framework that I was put into you know it wasn't my choice but I was there so I had a, a psychedelic experience as a 16 year old that really kind of helped shape a lot of the personal kind of socio-political cultural frameworks that I had been offered but never actually fully understood and it was right around then actually that I also discovered maps on the internet in like 2005 or 2006 so flash forward 10 years, um, while I studied philosophy as an undergraduate and I went to law school to focus on two things, either the domestic curtailment of civil liberties, focusing on surveillance and kind of that issue within the United States, or drug policy, because I had been studying incarceration and had been studying the way law enforcement in different countries was used to reinforce these massive kind of multinational systems of control via drug policy. And I knew that and had seen that and had been kind of experimenting, experimenting for many years, but didn't actually necessarily see the place where the connection happened. So I was working in civil liberties in incarceration reform and studying human rights when I was in law school. And then I met Natalie. And in 2015, we met and really kind of started realizing that because MDMA is so close to approval in the United States, we're now about three years away. Because cannabis was very rapidly becoming medically available and now recreationally available in the United States, because other research was happening with psilocybin and these other substances all over the world, we knew that something was coming and something had to change. So I was able to join MAPS really to help Natalie and to help Rick and to help the team focus on this kind of new space that we would soon be entering. We knew that, like cannabis, the process of mainstreaming a substance that's been demonized and stigmatized for so many years requires certain kinds of education, certain kinds of engagement and relationships. So I kind of brought that knowledge that I had and that experience that I have working in criminal justice reform and human rights and trying to bring a framework of access to medicine, of access to religious and spiritual freedom, of access to cognitive liberty, these things that our minds and that our bodies should have access to, but because of these repressive systems, whether it's the global drug control system or something else, are um, limited to people in these different countries, whether it's in the United States or otherwise. So the work I do with MAPS and the work that we do together is really about helping bring frameworks, bring regulatory, personal, cultural, medical, spiritual frameworks to this use in a way that actually gives the people who are having these experiences a place to land. In the 1960s, there was this huge explosion of interest in psychedelics, and everyone was really excited. But because in the West and in the North, you didn't really see the systems that you have in these indigenous tribes that have been using many of these substances for thousands of years, because we're kind of missing those systems, psychedelics showed up and then imploded, and then created this kind of emptiness, this, this reaction that prevented research for so many years. And now we're at a position where we've been doing research, we have some evidence, and we got to move forward. So. Okay, I'm, I'm talking a bit about the, the work we, we do from, from ICRs. It's uh, slightly different from the work uh, that MAPS do, but it's very related at the same time. We, well, we, our main focus is psychoactive traditional plants. Um, I mean, for that, like uh, plants like ayahuasca, iboga, uh, peyote, mushrooms, uh, etc. So um, the particularity that uh, we face is that, uh, well, the, the, in a broad sense, the, the mission of ICRs is uh, transforming uh, society's relationship with these traditional plants in a context in which uh, during the last two decades, approximately, 
we have uh, witnessed the expansion of, of these traditional plants uh, beyond their native context. So we can see now in many parts of the world that, uh, for example, in the case of ayahuasca, it's very evident that uh, many we, we can see many groups, uh, many ayahuasca churches, and many people organizing rituals, organizing ceremonies, and 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 this uh, expansion or globalization involves not only the ingestion of a substance in a like let's say um, um, leisure context or just to for fun, let's say, it involves the also the the, the exportation of of, uh, of a setting of a ritual and also the the intention goes far beyond like the the, the um, intention of having a, a, a pleasant time it uh, most of times involves a, 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 a an aim of, of, of personal development of exploration of healing or you know different uh, from like let's say like mass consumption, uh, mind-altering substances. So uh, in this sense, um, our work is um, it's, um, aiming to, to, to build bridges between the native context and in which these uh, plants, psychoactive plants, have been used uh, for millennium and the new uses that we, we we have been um, well. We, we 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 have been spreading in in, in non-native, let's say, non-native context. So uh, from this starting point, our work we, we have several uh, um, work streams. Uh, let's say mainly um, education, scientific research, legal and and policy work, and also community um, engagement. So, for example, uh, from uh, in 2014, we organized the first World Ayahuasca Conference in Ibiza, in Spain. And uh, one of the, 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 let's say, the most important results of this, uh, uh, of this event was that we brought together the ayahuasca community and the drug policy community. And in this sense, we, we have been working for approaching both the traditional plants um, um, interest people and the drug policy reform movement. So um, in, um, in the work that I do, I, I, will, I, I coordinate the, the legal uh, policy and human rights activities. For example, one of the services we provide, it's, um, it's under the umbrella of a program, a very big program in which Ismail also uh, collaborates. It's called the Ayahuasca Defense Fund. It's uh, well. The name says ayahuasca, but it's not only focused on ayahuasca. It's uh, it's focused on on several traditional plants. And in this uh, program, well, our work is uh, we basically received uh, queries of of people which has faced uh, legal incidents related to traditional plants. And some of these uh, people, they well, they got arrested or they faced uh, drug uh, trafficking charges for basically for importing the substances. Because one of the another characteristics of these uh, uh, traditional plants is that they are not usually uh, produced or they are they, they they are not usually produced in the same places where they are uh, used. So that means that, uh, for example, in the case of ayahuasca, the main producing countries are in the Amazonian region, so the, the beverage has to be exported to the places where it's consumed. So this implies that, um, that we, uh, yeah, we, 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 we provide this service of legal support to people facing um, legal troubles. And for example, we have been, um, Assisted, we usually go to court to to help the lawyers of these persons, and we provide expert witness testimonies, uh, expert reports, uh, uh, defense strategy, and we have participated in around 40 cases, not only in Spain, most of them in Spain, but all over the world. For example, in Chile, in Russia, in France, um, etc. And and in this context, well, m basically the, 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 the main, uh, I'm not sure if I'm going too long or 
microphone, just let me know. Sorry. <laughs> it's uh, it's um, in this um, context what, um, well, one of the things we have experienced is that the fact that some of these uh, traditional plants or traditional beverages contains um, psychoactive alkaloids, alkaloids which are uh, controlled under the international drug control conventions that probably you are familiarized with. This means that uh, these traditional plants and these traditional ways of, 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 of using them, they also fall under the frame of drug control. So this means that we, we, we are in, in somehow in between the traditional uses and the Western or yeah, um, Western motor, whatever we can say, uh, drug control frame. And um, in this uh, place in between, we are also trying to to promote. Well, we we, we work for uh, as maps as we work for for drug policy reform in a way we believe drug policy should be based in, in evidence, should be based in human rights, should be based in, in civil society participation, and not only the vision of, of, of the governments, and not only, uh, when I say ev evidence, it's not all, always or necessarily evidence in the sense we usually understand scientific evidence, but sometimes, uh, we can collect evidence, and that's uh, a, an important part of the work we do. We collect uh, scientific evidence that it's not always considered as such for the, the, the scientific mainstream uh, mm, collective. So that's an all, also an important uh, um, contribution that we are trying to push to, to, to open the spaces of debate of what constitutes scientific evidence and what constitutes uh, cultural rights and, and human rights and, and the rights of, of any person, no matter if you are an, a, a, an indigenous, no matter if where you are, the right you have to, to explore the options that traditional plants could provide for your personal healing and your personal development. Yeah. <laughs> just, just thinking about what you said, and now I have to go back to. to my, yeah. So um, um, after this, um, after this deeply meaningful um, personal scientific, uh, <laughs> after this deeply meaningful psychedelic experience that I had, um, I realized that everything I thought I knew about these substances was wrong. Like, I thought psychedelic drugs like LSD, they're like hard drugs, like heroin, and they damage your brain and they ruin your life. And um, I thought that because that's what I was told and that's what everybody else was told as well. And that's the stigma on these drugs. And the stigma couldn't be further from the, couldn't be further from the truth. There are, there is a large body of scientific evidence, um, hundreds of studies, thousands of participants, that has shown that these drugs are, if used properly, they are safe. They are low to non-toxic. They have very little side effects and they do not lead to addiction. And um, so after realizing that I had a completely false idea about these substances, I decided to do my homework and I went deep, 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 deep into the scientific literature and I read basically everything that I could find. And um, by the way, if you're interested in that stuff too, like all of the neuroscience stuff that I, that I read and learned, I share that on my blog in an easy to understand way with lots of infographics and cartoons. Um, <laughs> but that's not my point. My point is that after having done that research myself, 
I realized that the that these substances have the potential to fundamentally transform our approach to mental health. And the world doesn't know about it yet. <laughs> and that's why I started the Psychedelic Society, because, because we really try to foster an evidence-based dialogue about the true risks and benefits of these substances. So that's really inspiring to hear, and though the world doesn't fully know about it yet, more and more people are definitely learning, and thanks to psychedelic societies, you know, there are now over 90 psychedelic societies around the world, which it's really in such an important and exciting way of growing. Um, yeah, thank you guys. Um, I think Constanza touched on a very important topic that is actually how the Psychedelic Society of Vienna and the SSDPR kind of fuse together in many ways that it's very difficult to differentiate or like separate the topics of policy and any kind of research or scientific work or even talking about psychedelics when it comes to something that is criminalized around the world and just to promote a little bit Malena's work, you guys really should read it. If you want to know a little bit about how your brain works in general and on psychedelics and how it affects the, like, just read it, Sepian Soup. <laughs> All right, uh, the other thing that we talked about, uh, we mentioned that we talked a lot about healing and how using psychedelics is a new approach to healing ourselves and our clients and I want you guys to expand a little bit on how does that look in practice and how it is different from other traditional ways of, of healing or treating the symptoms, symptoms as you said. So I'm happy to um, take that as an opportunity to explain specifically the MAPS like therapy protocol and then maybe speak about how psychedelics because certainly there are many different ways in which psychedelic healing um, can work, but I know before I mentioned that we're focused on researching MDMA therapy to treat PTSD. Um, so MDMA therapy in the MAPS studies involves two therapists with one participant. Um, and it's a series of meetings, of, um, three sessions um, without, medic without medicine, um, and then the session with medicine, which we call the MDMA assisted psychotherapy session, is actually a six to eight hour long session. Um, and the participant is invited to put on a blindfold if they want, um, to listen to music. Um, and often at the beginning of the session, they're invited after they take the medicine to go inside um, and just kind of lie there and see what, what comes up. And one of the amazing things about um, psychedelic healing is that it's often about um, the, you yourself leading this healing process. So in the studies, um, I've had the privilege of watching videotapes of these MDMA therapy sessions. And you'll watch someone will be lying there and maybe moving their body, which is really amazing to watch. There's always kind of a physical, not always, but often a physical um, element. Um, and then maybe something will come up and they'll sit up and take off their blindfold and their headphones and want to talk to the therapist and process something. Um, and often there's kind of just the right thing will come up that needs to be processed. And, and we um, tell participants to, that, to let the, your inner healer or your inner intelligence guide the process. And the therapists are there to provide a safe container for the participant to, to guide the experience. Um, and it's really not about the therapist trying to force something or lead someone to a certain place. Um, and so that's uh, something that I think is really important you know, even outside of MDMA therapy, um, that you know, psychedelics are really uh, about kind of connecting to yourself and to others and, and that process of healing. Um, and then, I'm sorry, I realized I didn't finish the, the protocol. I'll just say after that, the MDMA session with the therapist, you actually spend the night as well um, in, with, at, at, in the clinic um, and then have a, a meeting again with the therapist in the morning and then you know, have sessions afterward. But so it's really a very um, comprehensive, long um, process um, that we've found is really able to maximize um, the outcomes of 
M MDMA therapy at least. And I'll just give a couple additional details that might help put it in context also. Most of the people that are going through the MDMA therapy process are doing like 12 to 15 therapy sessions. So it's only two to three of them are actually enhanced with the MDMA, but then after what Natalie just described, there's also integration, there's also post meeting. So ultimately it ends up taking a few months, a couple, like two to three months, right? Um, and it's definitely a process that integrates the MDMA into that. And one more piece to add to how the MDMA specifically works is some of you may have had experience with MDMA or ecstasy or something like that in the past. Many people who have experiences with MDMA or MDMA containing substances do so in recreational settings, in settings that are more open, concerts, festivals, clubs. Most people who have contact with it for the first time do them in those contexts, and they often do it because it increases empathy. MDMA is one of the only substances that we know of that's consistent in its process of actually allowing many people to access empathy. And when you do it in public, when you do it with a lot of people, that usually means in like a lot of public, like outside facing direct connection with people, which is why there's a stereotype of people taking ecstasy and hugging each other. But when you have the therapists around you and you have the amygdala being subdued, so your fear response is literally subdued in your brain, and you have this bloom of em empathy, and you have these two therapists, or because of maybe, yeah, Maybe, maybe perhaps it is because the fear comes up totally. And you have these two therapists that see your empathy and they turn it back in you. They're like mirrors. So they, instead of you being like, oh my God, all these things, you're like, oh my God. And you just sit with yourself and you sit with your own ability to like process those things. And that's a good example for how psychedelic he healing more generally works. It kind of blurs the line between physical healing and somatic healing and spiritual healing and mental healing because it kind of helps us realize that that holistic nature of the healing the fact that so many of these things are connected and that disconnect by itself is often what causes a lot of the disorders or problems or dissociations or misalignments that people have. So psychedelic healing more generally, whether it's MDMA or psilocybin or LSD or even ayahuasca or these other plant medicines, often what they do is they allow your kind of subconscious to release these blocks that allow a lot of things to come up, sometimes really traumatic things. The other big misconception is that psychedelic therapy is really fun because you're tripping the whole time. In reality, when you have the space and openness for that, that trauma or that experience to come up, it's actually quite challenging a lot of the time and you actually have to sit there and process and deal with it, which is why you have the assisting of the actual people that are with you. And it's not, common, it's not uncommon for people in social or public or recreational settings to do that in groups where you have these informal kind of therapy sessions with friends that are like dealing with these things that are coming up and maybe it's my relationship or my parents or something, but you know, maybe if it's not as focused, that kind of model of having, having the container that's safe that allows those things to come up is really kind of the nature of it and it really is kind of an internal external uh, balancing process with both the experiences that are coming up with whatever substance you're taking and then also all the things that are happening around one one thing that we do you know speak a lot about this process of mdma therapy but i really feel that we also have to share how many emails we get to maps all the time about people taking mdma at a rave and healing themselves and and that there really are so many, you know, certainly you'll hear more about other ways, but though we talk about the therapy, there really are lots of ways. Uh, thank you. And can we just for a moment talk about the order of magnitude of your work? Because I don't think it comes across really. What they do, yeah. So they're talking about post traumatic stress disorder, right? You all know what that is. Yeah, that's a condition that's really difficult to heal and it takes a long time. So let's think about their participants. This is the participants that MAPS work with. The participants are not regular pe people who are suffering from PTSD. These are people who, who are, these are, these are war vets, these are rape survivors, these are victims of sexual abuse in their childhood. These are people who have treatment resistance, PTSD, meaning they've tried many different therapies, they've tried psych meds, they've tried therapy, they've tried many things, and they've suffered from their condition for, on average, what is it, 17 years or something like this, right? So this is not the next best person 
who goes to a therapist because that person is suffering from trauma, which is bad enough. These are the really bad cases. They've tried everything, or they've tried a lot. So, after treatment with MDMA, after three sessions, one, two, three, right, with therapy and integration sessions in between. Of these participants who all had PTSD, 61% can no longer be diagnosed with PTSD. That is amazing. And if you think now that, okay, great, yeah, that's, that's three sessions, and then fast forward a couple of weeks, you know, life goes on and old patterns come back, no. Twelve months later, 68% cannot be diagnosed with PTSD anymore. Like, this is by far more effective than anything we have as a treatment available right now. And that is why, why MAPS will be, will be doing the almost impossible, meaning like really legalizing the first psychedelic substance in the US. Yes. I'll just say one thing. I w w really appreciate that context. It is important and we forget because it's like something that's just so kind of in the work that we're doing and the it's kind of interesting to be in this place to be doing drug development to attempt, be attempting to put something like MDMA, the stigmatized demonized substance, through a process like the Food and Drug Administration, which has the standard standards that these expectations that we, you know, our clinical researchers have been working on now for almost 20 years. And I will say that one of the interesting things that that comes up around this conversation is what we mean by this, that population of traumatized people. One of the big things that Natalie and I also do is kind of not only acknowledge that if and when MDMA or psychedelic therapy becomes available, that in order for it to have the truly effective impact on a large segment of society, that we can't limit our understanding of what PTSD or what these traumas are based entirely on certain standards of what society views as people who have PTSD. So the reality is that Trauma is the center of a lot of different disorders, and a lot of people from a lot of different backgrounds experience not just trauma, but PTSD, and not only from these really extreme ex examples. So of course it's true that people who go to war, people who are survivors of rape or sexual or physical assault, people who experience childhood abuse, these, these people are obviously experiencing these extreme traumas. But what's often underlooked is that people who experience discrimination, racial discrimination, gender discrimination, extreme poverty, people who experience frameworks of existence that are constantly growing on them, constantly affecting their livelihood, their quality of life, and people who have intergenerational traumas of those that are passed down through families are also often suffering from PTSD, often undertreated, often underdiagnosed, and also, in order for us to move forward fairly, should have access to psychedelic medicine when it becomes legal and available. So the idea is that these substances are, have been demonized, they've been stigmatized, they've been criminalized. The people who use them, the people who have been seeking them for healing, even when they didn't know they were doing it, have been criminalized for decades and decades now. So the work of legalizing psychedelic medicine, of taking MDMA through the FDA approval process, is drug development. It's creating a pharmaceutical that allows us to do that. But it's also fundamentally undermining the original tenets of this war on drugs, which is that these drugs don't have medical value, that they're dangerous, that they're bad, that they do all these things. And our question isn't, our statement isn't, we know that they work and we know that all these things are happening. We acknowledge that in order to say that in the way that we want to, the research is a humongous component. But we're also saying that you, amorphous you, the people who created these rules because of these systems that they believed were right maybe at the time, were wrong, and weren't just wrong, they were wrong and have caused a tremendous amount of harm, suffering, violence, and oppression because they were wrong. And this idea is like, okay, yeah, let's put it through the system, but 
we want to realize that the system itself isn't necessarily the thing that we're trying to follow. You know, in this case it is, but the system itself has caused a lot of harms, has caused a lot of those things. And that system that's connected to that larger oppressive system that then causes a lot of the trauma that then ideally we hope can be healed really does require us to acknowledge a responsibility on the part of the superstructure, on the part of these large systems that have caused a lot of that damage to actually be involved in the process of healing. Smell is speaking so beautifully. It reminded me that we actually didn't mention why um, the three of us, um, one of the reasons that the three of us are in Vienna um, this week, which is for the United Nations Commission on Narcotic Drugs meeting. So a lot of what we're thinking about right now is very much what Ismail is describing um, and about where these worlds intersect because though we may work at a research organization, you know, as we're discussing, politics are preventing that research. Um, and it's really important to find, for, for us to, to be um, finding the intersections between our work and so much other work. Um, and in that vein, a lot, you know, unfortunately at the UN, I can't say there's much being talked about on the psychedelic front yet. <laughs> yet. <laughs> However, that really helps us engage and realize how connected or where we fit into these other substances. And, you know, when we are speaking about the stigmas we face as psychedelic users, there's also really great stigma, you know, for users of other substances. Um, and so that's something that's just kind of coming up to think about um, when we identify, like, you know, the psychedelics certainly have really some ama amazing, unique um, therapeutic properties, but so do many of these other substances like heroin or cocaine or things we might more readily demonize or stigmatize. Um, so it's really important that psychedelics, to me at least, help us really question our assumptions about all of these um, substances. And that's a lot of what we're, we're thinking about this week, so I just want to bring that in. Yeah, that, thank you for mentioning this. Uh, we cannot stress enough how, how we appreciate your work working within the system to change the system. And this is something else I would like you to expand a little bit on because we've only briefly mentioned uh, plans for 2021 and um, legalizing MDMA for therapy. And I would just like to know more about the roadmap and what a post-2021 post world would look like when people suffering from serious mental illnesses would have legal access to this medicine? So the vision that we're um, building right now, um, at least for one way of people having access through the MDMA therapy, um, would be building kind of psychedelic clinics, therapeutic clinics. Um, and right now there's also a group in USONA sponsoring psilocybin or mushroom assisted therapy for the treatment of depression like in the same process as MAPS so they expect ho I mean, hopefully a few months or maybe a year after MDMA is approved psilocybin will also be approved in that context hopefully so you know in our in this um, dream vision we would see a, a clinic where people have access to all different kinds of healing modalities maybe there's also you know a body worker or in a you know and a yoga class and some kind of a, a context. Maybe there's beautiful garden outside. Um, really, you know, nature is incredibly healing. We look at the evidence and that's very real. Um, and so I think that's really kind of the vision. And again, you still, um, in order, I think, I don't know if I mentioned this, but to be clear, MDMA would not be accessible, you know, at the pharmacy yet again. <laughs> but um, so in these clinics, there would have to be, you know, doctors that have Schedule One licenses and ability um, to administer. But that's the beginnings of that vision. I can add a little bit for, like, the framework as well. So although, okay, so if you look at the example of how medical cannabis reform occurred in the United States, one of the biggest factors that changed people's perception of whether or not weed was medicine or not was knowing someone and talking to someone and have a relationship with someone that benefited from it. 
So there were originally a lot of people who were getting it primarily on the underground, and as they started to be more open and tell their family and friends, they realized that like this is real. And over time, that grew into a movement. It actually kind of really started with the AIDS movement in the United States around people who were suffering from AIDS who really knew that it would support their health, and then that kind of grew out of that. And then you have this medical cannabis movement. And from that medical cannabis movement, you have people who are seeing them, these people and be like, whoa, this works, and two, this really isn't that bad for that many people, and then you start to have conversations about adult use and recreational use. And I think similarly, the idea around the MDMA research is that there are, like, once people start to see and recognize that not just MDMA, but all of these substances via, or first MDMA and then psilocybin and these other substances are legit, that they're okay, that they work, that they're safe, by people having them in these legal contexts, because I'm sure lots of you have tried to convince your family, or at least some of you have tried to convince your family about how they work or don't, and they're like, that's great. When a doctor says I can do it, then I'll do it. But until then, don't even ask me. And a lot of people think that way, and for us, especially as young people, it's like, just look at the internet. The internet tells you all the things you need to know. But a lot of people do require that level of framework, that level of safety to move forward, and we want them to have access to that healing too. So the idea is like, once people start communicating with, engaging with people who benefit from that, we can have in parallel and must have in parallel a conversation around decriminalization. So the reason I bring that up is because 2021 is a powerful place because it could be the time when MDMA becomes legal in the FDA system. But before then, now and ongoing, there's an ongoing effort in the United States and around the world to also decriminalize because these uses aren't just good and unknown. They're good, unknown, and criminalized. And the fact that there's that additional level that needs to be addressed is something that we can do in tandem. And we can do that with evidence about other things, not just the therapy. And I think part of the longer term vision is also to make sure that as we're creating these legal contexts for them to occur, that the change of stigma, the change of perception, and ultimately the change of criminalization and access also changes. In the meantime, there's been a lot of change with kind of what Constanza was saying around access to an interest in plant medicine. So I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about if you see any change in legitimacy or access or all those questions around plants, around these more traditional systems that do have that context in addition? Well, I, I, I think the frame of the debate is a slight different because in the case of traditional plants, we, well, the, the ways that have been pursuing are not necessarily those of uh, like the, the, the classical Western medicine channels. So it's more developed for more developed by individual practitioners and and the, the way this knowledge is transferred to one group or one peop one person to others so it's like in for personal relations or 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 by um, contact with groups with other groups or via internet so it's uh, it's not um, as uh, let's say institutionalized, if I may use that word, as the, the, the word you are doing with MDMA at, in the context of, of, uh, of the United States. Um, this said, um, and coming back to the reason why we are here in Vienna, we, well, we, we, we have been planning for several months um, a side event. So the, this uh, meeting of the Commission on Narcotic Drugs, this commission is, is, is formed by, by well, 53 governments. And so it's, uh, the way it works is that there are several spaces where government delegation meets and adopt resolutions and uh, pacts or whatever, and also there is a set of uh, what it's called are called side events, in which uh, not only civil society but also other UN institutions or or government they collaborate in putting together thematic events on different topics. So we we decided to to explore the topic of uh, freedom of research. And this is very related to a set of, of rights recognized in the International Covenant on, on uh, Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. And it's the right of, of freedom of, of research. And this uh, involves uh, not only the, the, the fact of, of uh, having the possibility to, to conduct research on, on the different topics, but also to benefit 
from the results of this research. So we are together with, uh, with an Italian organization called Associazione Luca Colcioni, which are very focused on, on, on civil rights and civil liberties in, in, in Italy. Um, we, uh, we decided to, to, to focus or to, to, to concentrate the, the look of, the, of this government delegation in the fact that uh, what's happening with uh, the research with uh, controlled substances and also what's happening with the enjoyment of the results of this research uh, for the people that may benefit from, from, from them. And um, um, yeah, I was also excited that we're both ICERS and MAPS are co-sponsoring, but also with um, the government of Czech Republic is another sponsor for this event. You know, called the Free Right to Science and Freedom of Research with Scheduled Substances, and for pretty explicitly talking about psychedelic substances as well. So that I think was actually pretty encouraging and. Um, the Czech Republic is definitely uniquely open and progressive on, on these issues and a really great ally. Just to, to add something that, uh, well, there is one colleague of mine in the public and, and he is uh, one of the person, his name is Jose Carlos Boso and he, he's very shy, but <laughs> yeah, and, and he always stress uh, the, the fact because he is the, the director of scientific projects at, at ICRS, and he always stress the fact that uh, the barriers to, to scientific research come not only to because of the fact these uh, substances are under control according to the international drug treaties, but also due to the barriers that states uh, pose to, to to people like aiming to conduct research, especially independent researchers. So uh, this comes not only from, from I said, from the, the drug legislations, but also to several administrative uh, barriers that we, we, found, we find in, in, in our way. And for example, in the, in the studies we are conducting with uh, Ibogaine, it's a, it's a, a requirement that the, the Iboga and the Iboga you provide for these uh, clinical trial, trials is, is uh, manufactured according to what is called the good manufacture practices and the price of, of uh, to, to provide a very specific example, the price of, of, uh, of the, the Iboga necessary to conduct this study according to GMP, is, it's uh, 40,000 euros. So that's really difficult for a small or medium-sized organization aiming to conduct this type of, of, of alternative or, or not necessarily mainstream research. That's really difficult to, to, to fund. So we have problems in terms of, of legal barriers, in terms of administrative barriers, in terms of funding. So it's... Um, it's um, Maps. I think maps uh, have been very successful in in in, in how they have uh, jumped these uh, obstacles, but uh, yeah, yeah. But um, but it's not uh, always that. Uh, that's not always the case. So when we when we 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 think about drug policy reform or drug uh, or or psychedelic uh, science or research, it's also I think it's useful to open the scope of our of our uh, look and, and, and also think about all these like non so evident uh, barriers that we face. So I'm glad you mentioned uh, Ibogaine because correct me if I'm wrong, uh, this is somewhat of a gray area in sense of criminality because it's not scheduled in under the three treaties that kind of govern our national laws. Uh, and the the instant kind of association of people, like 
obviously not the people in the room, but um, general population when you talk about drugs is to addiction and uh, abuse of substances, whereas Ibogaine has been proved to very effectively help people get out of this vicious circle of addiction and abuse of substances. So if you could expand a little bit on how Ibogaine is used in these treatments, or um, if you have any specific experiences you would like to share in relation to Ibogaine. Not really, but maybe during the round of, of, of questions, we can ask Jose Carlos to share his uh, studies and his experience regarding Ibogaine. No? Yeah. Well, thank you. I will be very quick. We, we are th trying to start the study in which we are we want, we are planning to use ibogaine in the detoxification of methadone. Uh, as you well know, in Europe 20 years ago, there was uh, a very the, the um, use of, of heroin was very high, and then people start to uh, take methadone in order to. Uh, combat uh, heroin addiction, and now there are lots of people that uh, have a iatrogenic dependence to methadone, and what, what we are trying to do is to use hypocaine in a small doses just to detox detoxify from, from methadone. And this is the project that Constanza talked, just the encapsulation of hypocaine costs uh, 40,000 euros just the encapsulation. So there are too many uh, frontiers and barriers to research, not, all, not always the, the great international laws, but all the bureaucracy and all the different uh, bureaucratic barriers that we have to face, not because we are working with psychedelic drugs, but it's just uh, the, the same uh, barriers or, or frontiers that face every one that, was, that wants to work with, uh, or that works from an independent institutions and are not funded by, by the big pharma. Um, I would like to tell a little bit about uh, our uh, Ibogate project in Nepal. Uh, where we'll, uh, we will be able to work legally in the mountains, in the beautiful mountains of Nepal very soon. We uh, started uh, the legal process uh, a year ago, and uh, things in Nepal are a little bit easier than they are in the States because the focus on the world is not uh, too much on it. <clears throat> it's a very small country between China and India, and uh, I invite you all, if you're interested in the, in the project, to come to me and... Uh, global Health Village, but we didn't name it really right now, in the early stage. Yeah, so just to add a couple things about the gray area. Um, first off, thank you for sharing. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing, Jose Carlos. Also awesome. Um, we sponsored two studies, both of which were released in April and May of last year. One occurred in Mexico, one occurred in, occurred in New Zealand, looking at, it was an observational study looking at the effects of Ibogaine for opioid use disorder and for drug dependency. Um, and I just wanna just, the, there's a lot of kind of uh, weight to the word proved, and I think that what's happening now is that there, were, that there are scientists that are attempting to demonstrate its efficacy in these different contexts. There's a lot of anecdotal evidence, and there's a lot of um, personal experiences that people have had where it has been used for, um, for m primarily addiction interruption in different contexts, and I think that's really led to a lot of interest. However, this legal gray area is really confusing. It's not scheduled at the international level. In a, lot of, in a few countries, it's actually controlled, like the United States. But in a lot of countries, I think the great majority of countries in the world, it's actually just not regulated. So there's kind of this, there's been this move of uh, creating kind of gray area clinics where it's been used. And there's, a, again, been a lot of not strictly scientific data collected that has gone to that interest. So it is definitely the case that there's a lot more interest in it. In the United States, there's a lot of um, barriers in addition, and also because it has this additional stigma of being potentially dangerous in certain contexts for certain people when not carefully held, that 
does give it a little bit of a different flavor than the other psychedelics because as you said earlier, most of the psychedelics really are not toxic, really don't have addictive potential, really don't have it, nearly any of these like longer term harmful effects if done very carefully and with the right set and setting. Um, but I think with Ibogaine in particular, Niboga, there's a little bit more of a fear and stigma associated with it because of the kind of cardiotoxicity that's been associated with it in the past. So that does kind of add a little wrinkle of complexity, which you don't see with something like psilocybin or MDMA or even LSD. Yes, um, I wanted to I wanted to touch on one particular topic with you guys. So as I was as I was reading different studies of treatment of uh, different treatments, like with um, most of that was uh, treatment of depression with psilocybin, but it's kind of also similar to the uh, MDMA studies. One thing that I noticed is that um, basically after the dosing sessions, you always have a very strong effect, but then whether that strong effect lasts over time or the people kind of bounce back to how they felt before the treatment, what is really important there I noticed is the role of the therapeutic process that is not that is not the substance but that is actually the integration work. Can you talk a little bit about that? I can say that that's definitely true and um, some of our like pioneering therapists um, are such wonderful therapists that even the people who got placebo doses actually improved from the just <laughs> treatment of therapy, but they certainly didn't <laughs> at the same levels. Um, so the word, the first thing that really comes to mind is this concept of integration um, and how essential that is and really about um, what is happening after the process. Um, and one of the beautiful benefits of having two therapists present during the session is that a lot can be written down and still, you know, a therapist can be present with the participant and someone else can be taking notes. Um, and then in, in sessions fall afterward, um, there's a lot of kind of checking back gently and reminding about what had happened in the session um, and also providing different tools of helping integrate those realizations um, into your life. And I love that you gave the example of how people continue to improve because I think that's just some one of the most extraordinary parts of this treatment. And I think it has a lot to do with how in this session, it's a lot about kind of changing your framework and your understanding of, of the world and of your, your space and your experience in it. So in that peeling process, I think a big part of the integration is, is using that new framework, um, you know, in maybe your same life or maybe making some changes. And that can take some time and that can be really challenging. Um, so it's really important that in that time you have support, um, whether it's from a therapist, from family, from friends, um, you know, there was a participant in our study who um, was uh, had lost his home and didn't have a home at, at a part during, you know, during the process in the middle after I think maybe one or two sessions. And he not, you know, didn't have very great results and there was a lot of things going on and he wasn't able to be intentional about that integration. Um, but to be honest, besides that intentionality and, and support, integration can look very different for, for different people. Um, and you know, before I mentioned things like yoga or journaling or nature, and I know you chuckle, but truly spending time in nature is a really powerful way of integration and, um, and, and, and trying to incorporate these different practices into life. So, I just want to uh, provide a little bit more context around integration also, So, uh, and by, by uh, maybe offering a metaphor. So earlier, one of the examples that I gave, and one of the things that I think helps understand what happened in the West um, when psychedelics came onto the scene in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, and that was that um, Western culture, American culture, European culture got access to psilocybin, LSD, these other substances through questionable, sometimes sometimes questionable, sometimes really incredible means. And they kind of just like showed up on the scene and everyone started doing them and then suddenly they got associated with the counterculture and then people started dropping out and then they kind of imploded and everyone was like, wow, that was like really crazy. Do you remember when that happened? So that sends in a pretty sharp contrast to how psychedelic medicine, psychedelic substances have been used historically in the way that Constanza has been describing. So you have 
lots of cultures for hundreds and sometimes thousands of years all over the world on every continent that have had some, many of which have had some sort of relationship with some sort of psychoactive plant. It's just the case with a lot of cultures throughout history. And most of those cultures which have used a lot of these psychoactive substances for years and years and years and years and eons also have these intercultural, intergenerational rites of passage, systems of initiation and integration that are built into the system. So when someone has a powerful experience that totally shakes them up and totally kind of puts them into a new place, they have their grandparents or their parents or their cousins or their family to help kind of hold that. So I think that one of the, and that was really missing, that has been missing in the way that a lot of the West engages with these substances. So if you take that and make it very personal, you're thinking about integration. So in the same way that the Western culture was not ready to integrate the access to psychedelics that showed up in the 50s and 60s, many people, because the lives that many of us live are not aligned with a lot of the values that we believe we get access to when we have psychedelic experiences, require us to have the experience as this bubble, as the separate experience that we then have to pull out of to get back into our normal life, which kind of like reinforces all these other systems that have caused us all this harm and trauma. So integration on one level is how did that experience affect my, affect my feelings, my values? Does it affect my behavior? How can I engage with these behaviors in a way that has long on, ongoing supportive kind of relation to my life? One, and also it's primarily necessary because when we leave that context, the context of the medicine or the therapist or the ceremony, you're going into the world, the matrix, the place where we're all kind of like trying to survive because of this giant system that exists that keeps us all in all these places. So I think that when we're thinking about integration, it's like partially how can I learn from these things? And also, what is the system that I'm in that prevents me from always being able to access that all the time? Because the psychedelic experience, that thing is a key. It's one of the wormholes. It's one of the portals to get this access to something. Maybe it's trauma. Maybe it's higher consciousness. Maybe it's all these things. But the processing of pulling back, and not just pulling back out, but keeping a, a relationship with this thing that we experience, is that integration that can be done with so many ways, whether it's somatic work or mental work or talking with friends or whatever. And to going back to what you were saying, kind of just to bring it back to the therapeutic alliance or therapeutic relationship, the reality is a lot of these cultures that have had experiences with these substances aren't just developing a relationship with the facilitator and themselves, they're also developing a relationship with the substance itself and with the experience and with the culture itself. So part of the alienation that many of us experience in the West comes from not having those systems in the first place. So when you add psychedelics to it, things just get really chaotic. So part of the integration process is also living a life and creating a life day by day, routine, slowly but surely, that allows you to easily learn those things and then click in in different ways so you don't have to shift everything in your entire universe every time you eat mushrooms. Uh, I think that was a, a really good uh, point to sort of transition into the reflection of what this, I think we kind of understand that this movement has a, like a future that we probably cannot comprehend at this moment. And I would just like Malena to reflect a little bit, if she pays attention. <laughs> So I would like you to reflect a little bit on what has been said and what it looks like for from here uh, in Austria and what kind of relevance it has to all of us here who showed up today and interested in the topic. Oh, yeah. Questions? Yes, yes, I can ask a question. So, so before, yes. I'm looking forward to talking about that. But let's actually first address, um, so MAPS will uh, legalize MDMA for, for, therapeutic, um, for therapeutic use in 2021 in the US. How about Europe? currently fundraising for our EMA research. Um, we're trying to raise five million dollars, but we're actually well on our way there and definitely have fully intend to do research in Europe. Um, we will have a site in the UK and in the Netherlands and we're working out um, the other one or two sites also in the Czech Republic. 
um, but that will come a bit after 2021, but it's very much um, in, in the works and in our intention. Um, we also have a study, an MDMA therapy study in Canada um, and in Israel. Um, yeah, and I also say that there's other research going on um, in Europe right now. Um, there's uh, d different models, a group called, Cub, a business called Compass that's developing um, psilocybin in Europe or, or starting to do some research with that that I think will be starting um, before our research. Yeah, um, so thank you very much. Thank you so much for the work that you do, for the political work and for the research work, because, I mean, we've waited now for, like, for a lot of years. <laughs> we've waited for a lot of years and nothing has really happened. But, but, uh, but now, in 2016, 2017, we see for the first time that there are more there are more scientific articles published again on psychedelics than there were in the 60s. So this is really coming back. The psychedelic renaissance is really happening. And um, that, is thanks, that is thanks to the amazing work of, of, of MAPS, of ICERS, of a number of other institutions that are, almost all of them are funded by donations. And like um, you said, five million. Five million is nothing. Like, that's really nothing. You just raised how, how much? Yeah, so they just raised $30 million for the U.S. And um, the money is coming in. A lot of money is coming in from the crypto world. Psychedelics gets a lot of love from the, from the crypto world. We're very grateful for that. Yeah, so um, I think it's I think it's just amazing that we see like that with psychedelics we we see the rates of some of the most prevalent psychological conditions plummeting like post traumatic stress disorder, depression, treatment resistant depression, addiction, you name it. And uh, after having having researched so much myself as well, I. I deeply believe that these substances, these substances will revolutionize the way we approach mental health. And my, my personal dream is to open a treatment center here in Austria where people, can have a, where people can have a safe, transformational, psychedelic experience. <laughs> um, <laughs> for their inner healing, for their personal development, for working through the difficulties that they may have. Um, so that's a mid to long term dream. <laughs> now, the first thing we have to do is we have to get psychedelic research to Austria and we have to work on the public perception of these substances. We have to, we have to spread awareness of the of the of the therapeutic use of the beneficial use of these substances, and that's why I started the psychedelic society here in Vienna because that's exactly what we do. We foster an evidence-based dialogue about the true risks and benefits of psychedelic substances, and the way we do that. Now, I, actually, I need my notes and my slides because we do so many things. You will be amazed. So, s something we do regularly is that we hold regular meetups regular events, we call them meetups. Some of you might know the platform meetup.com, we use that to organize these events. And what we do there is that we invite uh, national and international guest speakers to talk about interesting topics. Like we had a doctor, for example, talking about MDMA-assisted therapy. We have speakers talking about um, 
the effects of very large doses of psychedelics. We have speakers talk about the effects of very small doses of psychedelics. You know, some biohackers um, use very small doses of LSD or psilocybin, for example, to uh, replace coffee or to replace psych meds that they are taking, like Adderall or how it's called here, Ritalin. Now, we not only um, look at these practices, but we also try to shed some light on the scientific evidence that is behind these practices or the lack of scientific evidence. What else we have uh, next week? We will have we will have a meetup where we invite an where we will invite an Austrian lawyer who is specialized on uh, drug law to talk about the legal situation of psychedelics in Austria. Um, I invite you to come. This is a great opportunity to have a free consultation with a lawyer. Um, another thing that I'm very proud of what we're doing is that we are building a community here in Austria. What you might not know is that people who have had a psychedelic experience often feel isolated afterwards. And I want to explain to you why that is. So a 2008 study at Johns Hopkins showed that um, about two-thirds of the participants who took a psychedelic substance um, rated this experience amongst the five most meaningful events of their lives, next to the birth of a child or the loss of a parent. Now imagine you've just experienced something that big and then you cannot talk to anybody about it because of how stigmatized and how misunderstood these substances are. This is why the community aspect of the psychedelic society really matters because with us, people can talk openly about their psychedelic experiences and some, and some even say that with the, that, that's the psychedelic society, it feels a little bit like coming home to them, which personally makes me very happy. Um, so what you have to understand though is that so we're not a we're not a secret club or a bunch of new age hippies. We are common people with common lives. We're students and professionals, we're activists and reformers, we have we have families, we have careers, we're so many things beyond our interest in psychedelics, and yet our fascination for these substances bring us together and make us want to change something about the status quo. And just in case you wondered, like, do I need to have had my own psychedelic experience in order to go and attend their events? No, you don't. Like, you can, you, you can just come with whatever background you have. Actually, a lot of people who come to our events, they've never had um, their own experience, their own personal experience with these substances. They just come because they're interested in the topic, and that's totally fine. What else do we do? We do, uh, we do different workshops. We do regular integration circles. So we just touched on the topic of integration. Um, because, because we're well aware that, this is, that, that, if you, that if you criminalize a substance, not only the substance goes away, but also the whole, the whole ritual and the whole culture around the substance, like, uh, like something that's deeply integrated into a culture, um, it's now on us kind of to bring that part back and to offer this integration work, to offer, to, to like help one another to bring back the culture of integration. And this is what we do in this integration circles. And then, um, what's interesting, you uh, mentioned before the 90 different psychedelic societies. So there are really a lot of psychedelic societies popping, popping up all over the world. There is no headquarters or, uh, <laughs> or something, but we're all pretty well connected with one another. And 
were also connected to the universities and were connected to uh, local nonprofits. So overall, we could build a pretty good network of international experts. So if you're interested in the topic and you can imagine if, uh, to, to pursue this topic as a future career, then we're thrilled and we will also try our best to support you. Good, so if you're interested in what you've heard so far, then I invite you to simply come and check out our next event. Our next meetup will be next week, Wednesday, on the 21st. That's where we will invite the drug lawyer for, for the open Q&A session, for an extended Q&A session. So make sure you bring your questions. Like, if I go for a walk in the Vienna wood and I find something on the ground, may I pick it up? Like, something like this. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, it's an interesting question, right? I mean, we want our members to be safe, physically and legally. <laughs> yeah, good. So, and even if you're not interested in that particular topic, um, it's still worth coming because after, because after the talks, there's always time to come and uh, talk to me and the rest of the team. So, I invite you to come. Generally, the Psychedelic Society, how can you find us? Our website is psychedelicsociety.at. My email address is malena at psychedelicsociety.at. We're also on Facebook. On Facebook are all of our events, our meetups, our community meetings, our integration circles, events like this one today. Um, and as an alternative, you can also check out Meetup. We're there as well. But Facebook is certainly, but on Facebook, there's certainly everything. Uh, yes, and Sapien Soup, this is my blog again. If you want to dig a little bit deeper, um, do it. I published a seven part series. There's really a lot to read there. Uh, and yeah, I'm interested to know what you think about it. So let me know. Thank you so much. And um, with this, I would like to open the floor for questions. But before that, if some of you are shy or have more complex questions regarding the Psychedelic Society or have contributions, we are always welcoming new members. Um, we are an um, ever-expanding team. Some of our members are here in the audience wearing MAP stickers, so just approach them with your craziest questions. Um, and there are more stickers if you want to become a member and wear them yourself. So if anybody um, has any questions for our panelists, this is your time to shine. Just raise your hand and one of our members, team members, will rush to you. Uh, hi, everybody. Hi. My name is Martin Damien. I'm a member and co-founder of Slovak Psychedelic Society and also a member of Czech Psych Psychedelic Society. And I do have maybe two notes. First, I want to congratulate ECRS to start to get the funding from the European Commission and start their f uh, website, Psychedelic Plans. It's a big thing. I don't know if you know something, but you can say something more about it. And another question or note is about the maps and your MDMA research. You were mentioning that you are now trying to raise the money for European part of the research and you are planning to start it after 21 not before, or because when I was in the US uh, May last year, there were the initial uh, meetings about European part of MDMA research, and it looks like they will start and finish in the same time. This, this just changed a little bit. Right, thanks for clarifying that they will be starting before 2021, but they won't be fin like finished by 2021. So it's just kind of at a, a little a back of a timeline. Maybe one year delayed, but the parallel is starting. Yeah, so uh, 
your question about CK plans. Yeah, yeah, that's um, a part of a, of a project, a, a European Union project. We are in collaboration with uh, all the three European or organizations, and basically, it's uh, what the the page uh, provides is uh, information about different uh, psychoactive plants that uh, many of them are not under control, but uh, we do don't easily, well, you can find a lot of information available online, but it's uh, usually not always accurate or it's at uh, some point contradictory. So we, we are uh, providing this service of information on the, um, well, the, the, the historical background, scientific information, uh, um, legal um, status and also on the effects and, and the therapeutic potential of some of them. And, and also there is in this uh, website, it's called CK Plants. We, we also provide a service of, of integration. So you can make an appointment with uh, Mark Aishala, which is our uh, therapist at ICRS. So, and you can have a face-to-face -face interview well, via uh, Skype or video, video conference, and and he provides uh, support, guidance, and advice on 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 the well different uses or the different experiences you you may have with this uh, shred, well with these uh, plants. I also want to say, Martin, because you mentioned we were talking about all these different psychedelic societies, and there are actually many people in the room who are or involved in their psychedelic societies in their countries, including Brun from Mexico and Ava from Czech Republic, somewhere over there, um, and a lot more um, in town this week. So I just wanted to draw attention to that. There's some amazing people here. Can you hear me? Yeah, perfect. Okay. So, more questions then. Yeah. I lost you right now. Okay. Um, hi, hi. Thanks for coming. Uh, my, my question um, is about the, the UN and the kind of counter reasoning that you experience so what do people say you know well, what are the arguments especially given there's portugal and, and, and the czech republic all those places where clearly they haven't kind of fallen into chaos after legalizing uh, certain drugs so, so what are the arguments that you that you face at the un for example what would people say when, when you're like hinting at the benefits what are the arguments of you know, what, there is no numbers that speak against legalization and stuff, if you know what I mean. So, what, what's the point? What's their point? We're, we're all laughing a bit because what you say is so real that, you know, we have science, evidence. We try to use the most rational, logical arguments. If you look from a financial, econo economic perspective, if you look from compassionate, humanitarian perspective, you, there's really my perspective every single way, you know, it's a, a rational argument that does not land. And, you know, the drug control system is not in any way based in, in science or in that type of logic. So it is a very difficult um, push back and forth. Um, and I think the stigma is one thing that we've been speaking about, and I think it really shows, and it's, there's often a very reactionary response, you know, the drugs are bad kind of response that doesn't necessarily allow people to, you know, why would you give heroin users needles? That's in the U.S. still, some, finally, unfortunately, because there's such a crisis, people have been forced to be more open to that, but for so long, people were absolutely uninterested that it helps reduce reach contraction of HIV, hep C, never mind overdose and, and problematic use, but American politicians, I am not giving drug users need, why would I enable them? Like that's really, it could really end just there. Um, you can, I just wanna give a little bit extra context. So Portugal and Singapore and the Philippines and the United States all say that their drug policies work. So that's one problem because everyone has their every there are, there are different standards by which certain people and certain countries dis determine whether or not they've been successful. So which again may or may not 
not often not be grounded in actual statistics, facts, uh, amount of lives saved, any of these kind of measures that we would use. And it's interesting because when we're, you're trying to convince people where the diversity of opinion is on one hand, you have an example like in Portugal or Czech Republic where you have more liberal, more open drug laws where you're seeing that stigma slowly start to change. Even, even in Portugal, although there have been a lot of good a lot of a tremendous amount of positive feedback and a lot of good outcomes from that that shift. There is still stigma within Portugal of drug users. You know that takes more than 10, 15 years to change. So I think when you're talking about countries that are still, and there are many countries that still defend executing people who use drugs, much less drug dealers, much less people who are kind of part of huge international criminal networks. That issue of stigma and the associations that come with that are so strong that for a lot of people. Even, even you know, for very conservative people, especially maybe in the United States, the idea that there are these positive outcomes doesn't even really enter that universe. And it's like, it, it's part of that issue where it's kind of an esoteric stigma because it's based on things that were never true, but that over time, because of the, in part because of the lack of research, not only, have become true in the public image. So you're not, we're not trying to convince them that their facts are wrong because they were never using facts. We're trying to convince them that the ideology, that your, their fundamental understanding of crime and punishment is wrong. And it's hard because it's not, and, and, and the feelings, it's, it's a very emotional, it's a very emotional engagement for us, I mean, for some people. But even though, you know, I'll give the example of the United States, all this is true of a lot of countries, although they'll sound like we're doing a rational no on drugs, if you just say no, then they'll prevent it, whatever framework, even though that's clearly and obviously wrong, and they think that it's coming out of logic and reason and like the way that things work, what I think that ideology is hiding is like this deep emotional response that's very based in stigma, often based in racism, often based in these biases that are super baked into people's understanding of drugs and drug users that they don't even know because that's not what gets talked about in public anymore. Now you just have the, well, they're bad, so we're there. And I think that, you know, I, I don't know the answer to your question because that's part of why so many of us are here because we're trying to, and people have been trying to for decades now, even just suggest not not necessarily not only that their frameworks are wrong but that they're causing these harms that are preventable by look at all this evidence and even that isn't necessarily moving things did you want to say something yeah please i think uh, a lot of gulf oils are uh, not part of the solution they're part of the problem uh, in afghanistan and pakistan for example is that not working can you hear me okay. can you hear me no. okay uh, uh all right in pakistan and afghanistan for example uh, the high rank <laughs> uh, the high rank uh, uh, government people, please don't. That's the wrong way. Uh, uh, <laughs> the the high rank government people are, are, are earning from that, and they would do shit to, 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 to change that. And then the, there is another thing the ph pharmaceutical industry. Uh, your, your MAPS is a competition for them. So uh, they, they have a lot of influence, and they have a for 50 million is a joke for them. Just in this state, but yes, I mean, on the cannabis policy level, pharmaceutical companies are literally donating to politicians who are opposing cannabis reform. Um, you know, in the U.S., states with medical cannabis have a 25% reduction in opiate overdoses and have a dramatic reduction in pharmaceutical um, use. So that is a huge um, piece of this. What, what, um, who is served by these current systems? Um, after Trump was elected in the U.S. and, you know, he appointed Sessions, who was very tough on drugs, the, the stocks for all the prison companies, private prisons, went through the roof, right? It's serving certain industries very well. Um, and I do think that's something we really need to, to think about. And, you know, as we're like, oh, this stigma, people just say no. No, there's definitely very entrenched interest in protecting what's going on. And as Ismail said, um, what were these systems designed for? In the U.S., drug, the drug control scheme was designed to uh, marginalize and incarcerate people of color. And it's doing a very good job of that. So, you know, it's, it's working for a lot of people, unfortunately. Um, so the 
pharma industry is not interested in the psychedelic research um, because I think uh, MDMA, the patent expired. And um, how can you convince the pharma industry for this cause? So, first of all, that is a really interesting question. And yes, it's both that MDMA, the patent has expired. But on top of that, um, Rick Doblin, who are the MAPS founder, actually has an anti-patent strategy <laughs> to try to encourage anyone who has any kind of healing experience with MDMA to write it online in some public sphere so no one can patent and, and try to use that. Pharmaceutical companies are also not interested because you could heal from one session. So they're not a very productive customer for them, right? So in that way, I mean, I don't know that I want um, personally, you know, and I don't speak for all, all of MAPS in this, that I want the pharmaceutical company um, engaging. MAPS itself is a nonprofit, and we've um, spawned a public benefit corporation for when um, we do start to sell MDMA, but that um, entity allows us to not prioritize maximizing profit. Um, so we prioritize instead public benefit, and that makes me feel a lot better about our approach because I see a lot of harms um, coming from the pharmaceutical industry and impacting our whole approach to mental health based on profit, profiting from individuals taking medicine consistently. Um, so I think that whole framework is really um, a huge problem. And yes, we are using that framework, you know, we're using the system to try to change the system, but we're very conscious of, of that. Um, and I do have, you know, some fears that pharmaceutical companies may start wising up the way they are with cannabis. They've been doing a, I mean, not enough of a good job, but they have been stop really slowing cannabis reform down um, the best that they can. And I don't know what they'll do when they, when they really realize that psychedelic therapy could <laughs> take away a lot of their business. But, but I will, as I'm saying all of that, I do also have to say that many people will find tremendous life-saving relief from pharmaceuticals as well. Um, and so this isn't like, we don't want any pharmaceuticals ever, and there you know, are places for different things, but my personal um, issues are with the whole systems and of incentives for creating that, and that's why I would not necessarily personally want MDMA to go through that process. Okay, this time I'm not losing you. <laughs> I don't really have a question, but I would just like to draw attention to something that I think is very important, and that is one of the general messages of the psychedelic experience is that we can actually change very, very quickly, as you have displayed it very beautifully here, not only the patients who are suffering from severe problems, but generally anyone who uses psychedelics, uh, their attention draws or falls upon things which are a part of their lives like generally, but they never actually focus really on it tightly enough so that they can make a positive change. Uh, there's even one very interesting case. There's a mycologist uh, named Paul Stamets. Maybe you have heard of him. Uh, he basically healed his stuttering after just one use of a very high dose of, of psilocybin mushrooms. And that phenomenon is actually then not physiologically uh, like healed, but rather with the attention. His attention simply fell on the way he speaks and then just something clicked and he just like 90% of his stuttering stopped after just one session. And exactly that point is I think a bit frightening to the general western mind which is always kind of focused on the ego and the person and this is who I am and like the rigidity, the psychedelics kind of make us more like flexible and make, make us able to, well, have a more flowing experience of the world and generally there are, as Terence McKenna would say, boundary dissolving agents, which are non-specific amplifiers. <laughs> 
I just wanted to say um, one, quick, two, two quick responses to that. Um, one, which is that there's a book that came out about a year ago by uh, Joe Tafur called Fellowship of the River. He's a medical doctor from the United States. He's Colombian who went to Peru and studied with the Shipibos for six years and now gives ayahuasca. He pours ayahuasca as a shaman. And it's really interesting because he speaks a lot to that issue, which is like the psychosocial and psychocultural con uh, constructions of disease and how that's affected by the kind of spiritual experience, whether in this case it's ayahuasca, but the, the idea that a lot of people who have many different disorders or effects or whatever are often very quickly and sometimes, sometimes, I mean, it takes time. It's not always one session, you know, often it takes a long time, especially for deep traumas, but that there are links slowly being built over that like weird esoteric psycho-spiritual boundary of healing. So that's one thing. And the other, which you almost got to, but I, you kind of reminded me of is that when you're talking about the benefit of the individual, um, that it actually kind of radiates out. And you know, one of the studies for psilocybin that's occurring in the United States is psilocybin for end of life anxiety. Um, and last year, at the end of last year, I went to a conference uh, about psychedelics and end of life care. And one of the big themes was that for people who are near the end of their life, whether it's because they have a terminal illness or because they're very elderly or whatever else, um, that the psychedelic experience does frequently benefit them a lot because it helps manage their fear of death. That's a huge part of it, and the, their mortality, their relationship with mortality, little questions like that. Um, but that the other big impact and what they were talking about a lot was the people around the people who are suffering. So, for example, when you have someone who's dying, who's like at the center of some system, they're not the only ones who are experiencing the fact that these things are changing. It's also happening to all the people around them. So that kind of boundary dissolving, not just literally in your own minds, but like literally boundary dissolving between you and your family and these other people. And kind of realizing that the value is in so many ways, like that kind of shift in perception or like outside, outside kind of symbolic perception of your own experience, which then allows you to look at it in all these ways that do shift that. So yeah, thank you for bringing that up. I was reminded when you were talking about how it impacts everyone around you that um, we actually got the first approval to give MDMA to a couples where one person in the couple has PTSD um, and not necessarily romantic couples actually so there's some other um, but just kind of a partnership and I just think that I'm really excited when, for that study to progress because really so many of these things impact more than the individual. So I think we have time for one more question because all, I know all of y'all guys have a very long day behind you and ahead of you. So um, there was someone else before you, unfortunately, and he's really close to the mic. So go for it. Uh, as we were speaking about the pharma industry, how reasonable does it seem like after, especially after the kind of uh, decriminalization or legalization of MDMA therapy as well to get like more money behind it? Let's, for example, the military budget with like all the... PTSD suffering military people like to get money behind the project as well. How do you like more kind of like more ideas like this? More yeah, ideas. definitely. And the farther along that we get in in the research, the more support we have from. Like right now, they're actually um, we're working with researchers who work with at VAs or veterans like uh, med spaces where veterans in the U.S. can go to get medical care. So we're already working on an individual level, but you're right, right now the U.S. government is unfortunately not <laughs> funding our MDMA research, though they did give us $2 million, $2 million for our marijuana study, from, but from the state of Colorado, not from the U.S. government. It's a little different. Um, but I do see that as we um, progress, I hope we will have more funding um, from veterans, and we certainly are finding funding right now actually from um, sources from unlikely sources um, who are passionate about healing veterans. Um, and we recently received a million dollars um, from a, a, tr a very um, traditionally conservative donor who, you know, politically may donate to certain things that um, people might not have expected that she would have supported this work, but her dedication to American mil military veterans um, inspired that, that gift. Um, I'll just say along those lines, once I, I, pr I bring that up, that it is something that's really interesting with this work, that um, because it connects to actually such a wide range of people, you know, though it does have this association with, with hippies and, and the left, and certainly 
you know, there's a reason for that. <laughs> um, but I think that it's easy for us to ignore that there's actually, you know, in the U.S., a big libertarian movement that many are, are quite um, interested in psychedelics. And and even we're, you know, reading more about um, across really far, even far-right groups that use psychedelics. Um, so I think that's something interesting for us to kind of keep in mind that psychedelics definitely make us question things and connect and open open. Um, up to different things, but I think when you were talking about this non-specific amplifier, um, that that yeah, they they can exist in in lots of different contexts, and it really has a lot to do with the setting that you use them in, um, how how they will impact you. I'll just say two things. One, um, regarding it's very like literally speaking, regarding funding, because our phase three process is essentially funded in the United States, it actually doesn't matter. I mean, it, they could give us a ton of money, that'd be great, but there's no kind of motivation at this point for any US organization, whether it's the VA or the Department of Defense or whatever, to fund it, even though, as you say, like there seems to be pretty clear implications for the amount of money that it could save healthcare systems that are dealing with those people. That's true. Um, and I just want to add a little bit to that point about psychedelics being non-specific amplifiers and how that kind of ties into this, because the idea that, like, when we've joked about it a lot, we've kind of implied it a lot, is that psychedelics are these, like, blooming things that give us access to all these amazing pieces. And although that's often true, because they're used and can be used to help optimize experiences, the possibility of them being, if not weaponized, that's a pretty strong word, but at least kind of used in those frameworks that are within the system in a much larger way, is certainly exists. And the idea is that once it's legal, we will not necessarily be able to control who uses it and how it's, how it's used. So that's kind of part of the reason why it's actually really important to engage at the psychedelic society level, at the level of individual people and communities that could benefit from it. Because if we as a collective don't actually build into the movement and into the process of getting legal access, then they, like everything else that becomes available, can easily be co-opted. Maybe not, maybe not as easily as some things, but certainly can be co-opted by the military system, by the prison industrial complex, by these huge complexes that cause a lot of oppression. So if we want to be really vigilant and be aware of the potential benefits in a real way, benefit for individual people and for families and for those systems, we have to be aware of that fact that they can be, that, that like the, the way that they're used, the mechanism, the framework within which they're used does matter a lot. And if we want them to be used in a way that's really, that shepherds in a new world instead of creates some sort of like esoteric gatekeeper that some people get access to because they deserve it and some people don't, then we have to build in those systems of like human rights and social justice and criminal reform and all of these things that really need to be built in to this conversation around decriminalization and eventual access. Thank you very much. That was a perfect ending to our event today. Thank you very much, Natalie, Izzy, Constanza, Malena, and thanks for all of you for coming out today and listening to us. Have a good night.